So we're just going to go live on Facebook here. We did get internet. Couple things, just uh, some housekeeping things. We do have bathrooms downstairs. You know, we do. You know, kids. We have uh, color crayons and and uh, and and coloring books in the back. Or some pages in the back. We do have a book that. It's called The Lamb. You know, there's a book back there that uh, doesn't have, uh, if we need to open another one, you know, if you young guys uh, want to sit in there and want to look at a great book, it's scriptural, it's about Jesus Christ and uh, him going to the cross. Uh, it's a great story for kids. We do have a nursery here, and, uh, but we yeah, definitely love having kids in the church. So my granddaughter's the noisiest, so. It's all right. We'll just stick her in the aisle and let her be noisy because we know what kids in the church means it's alive. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. I don't want people to be like, oh, no, that's okay. Um, before we get into that, I just want to talk about we have a pancake feed coming up. So we definitely want to do more for the community, get more people involved. And so we're going to have a pancake feed. Pancake feed. It's called, it is uh, October 10th. At noon, so an uh, hour after church service is done, we're going to meet downstairs, invite the people in the community, invite people out. If they've never been here before, it's something we'd like to do for the community. It's something we want to do the second Sunday of October. It'll be our annual thing, so it'll be a pancake feed. We also want to do a fall Thanksgiving, so the Sunday after Thanksgiving, for the people of the church. We'll have our own Thanksgiving down, downstairs on a Sunday. And uh, we uh, can talk about what we want to bring, but we want to have more fellowship. You know, like I said, when I get out of some of my evening classes, we're going to start a Bible study here in the evenings and things like that. A prayer list. If you're not on the prayer list, you can email me and I'll get you on the prayer list. There's power in prayer. And we want people to remember to remember people in prayer all week. Philippians 1.19, it's one of the first verses we're going to talk about. But ultimately, Paul talks about how he was delivered through people's prayer. It's important that we pray for each other. We remember that we, you know, Galatians 6 tells us that we're to yoke up with each other. So email that list out weekly if it needs to get updated. If you want something specific on there, if you want something removed, let me know. I try not to put last names on it. We keep things confidential. But we want people to pray for people. And, uh, and partner in prayer. I partnered with a couple individuals this week, you know, one this week, one last week. And it was uh, an awesome experience to be able to partner with somebody in prayer. Even though we pray for everybody, that person and their specific prayer requests, I remember multiple times through the day I had a text that I, you know, that I sent myself to remember these things. And I would encourage you to partner with somebody in prayer. Partner with somebody in prayer. Money, we don't uh, pass an offering here. So there's a box in the back that's between you and the Lord. Kevin's not here and Brian. Brian leads singing. His wife plays piano. We are fortunate to have other singers and other piano players here. But the elders of the church do not take a wage. Uh, all money is used for the furtherance of the gospel. Like, just so you know, like yesterday, money was sent to the Philippines. Money was sent to Kenya. And money was sent to Haiti to help pastors that are clear on the gospel to get the word out. We're getting more heaven tracks made and we're gonna ship them to Kenya soon. And I'm getting some heaven tracks made with, that are in Filipino that we're gonna to send to the Philippines. That's what the money is being used for. It's all the furtherance of the gospel of Christ. Our mission here is uh, ultimately that we, is Mark 16, 15, that's our mission. To go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Our vision here is that every person that hears that would believe it. And ultimately, 1 Timothy 2.4, that all men would be saved. That is the vision. But for this to happen, 
For that to happen, we need soul winners. We need soul winners. People who want to, to be fisher of men. We have a lot of fishermen and hunters and trappers in here, but the goal is, to, that's what we need. We need people to hand out tracts. We need people to invite people to church. We need people that want to write a letter, share the gospel, whatever. We work together to make those things happen. Because we know what? I, hell is real. Hell is real. And people are going there every single day. And it is our job, as Christ came and Luke there, he come to seek and save the lost. And I believe it is our job, that's exactly what we're to do, to come and seek and save the lost. So a couple things that what we do here, we have verses with page numbers on the Bible, and we have some specific learning outcomes that we would like you to look at every week, because we are a learning church, we're a Bible-believing Bible teaching church, and I believe you should learn something, try to learn something every week. So specific learning outcomes this week is every listener should be able to explain the difference between grace and mercy. Grace and mercy are different. Grace and mercy meet at the cross. Well, what are they? Do you understand what they are? Hopefully through the message you can understand that and ultimately explain that. Every listener should be able to give one example of kindness. Not kindness, what we see in the world, but a kindness that's demonstrated in the Bible. What does kindness look like? You should be able to, after today, you should be like, every time you think of kindness, an example, a picture of kindness will happen in your mind. You'll be like, yes, that's what kindness looks like. And then every person going to heaven should be able to clearly write a simple sentence why they're going to heaven and why they're not going to hell. That would be one other objective outcome that we want everybody that you could literally write it down why you're going to heaven and why you're not going to hell. The name of the message today is the riches of his grace. The riches of his grace. If you turn over to Ephesians, the prison epistle, we're reading chapter 2, 1 through 10 today. But the purpose, the purpose of this message is to be motivated to share the gospel of Christ. Motivated. Paul, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious zealot. He was, you know what? He was a very important person of his time. And on the road to Damascus, he kept kicking the pricks. He was ultimately attacking Christians, killing them. And on the road to Damascus, he gets saved. That man took the rest of his life and he made it his passion to be a soul winner. He went on three mission trips. He was beaten. He was jailed. He was stoned. He was beaten with rods. All because of the gospel of Christ. So then I say hell is real and people are going to hell with their sins paid for. Christ already paid for their sins but they have not believed in, in Christ alone. Somebody needs to tell them. I was watching a documentary this week on 9-11. Two brothers. And you can have whatever you want back there. Fill those pockets up. It's all right. <laughs> but I was watching two brothers. They were doing a, a, a documentary on uh, La Engine 7, Ladder 1. It was one of the closest, you know, uh, firehouses closest to 9-11 there, to Twin Towers. And uh, they were documenting about a boy who just came out of, you know, training there. And he was uh, his first week or two weeks on the job and how a boy turned into a man. And at the time they were documenting, they heard a noise and he flips up the camera and they see a plane come into the tower. I don't remember, South Tower, North Tower first. Yet every one of those guys ran into that burning building. And then another plane hit within 45 minutes to an hour. By the end of the day, 343 firefighters dead. And I say, most people around us are in a burning building. 
They're spiritually dead and going to hell. Most men I know, I know a lot of awesome men, and I know there's a lot of men here, they would have done the same thing. They would have rushed in that building to save others. And they would have given their life. They would have put their lives at risk to save others. Physically put their lives in danger. If we would do that physically, why, why are we not motivated to do that spiritually? And after today's message, it's my desire that you be motivated to save souls. Because a person's second death, and we're going to look at that in Revelation 20, their spiritual death is far more grievous than the first death, physical death. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And he says, You, and you hath he made alive. Just so you know, I read out of the authorized King James. You know, some of you have the King James, and so made alive. You're in the King James, it'll say quickened. And you hath he made alive, who were dead in trespass and sins, in which in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all had our manner of life in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God was rich in mercy. For his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're going to review a little bit here quickly. Last week we got up to verse 4, but I just want to talk about verse 2, Paul speaking to believers in Ephesus. We need to understand that the Bible here, that the author's intended message, who he was speaking to. Paul was speaking to the Ephesus, believers in Ephesus. It's a town in present-day Turkey today. He was in prison. So we can get a historical background, understanding where this is at. But he wanted them to know God's power. Because that was the power of prayer that in, verse, in chapter 1 we studied 15 through 21 is the power. There's times in my life that I need to be reminded of God's power. I do. One of the things I'm reminded of is that God saved me from a hell I deserve to have and I don't. He saved me from a hell I deserve to have and I don't. It is God that gives me the strength daily in life to get through the day. I've lived the Christ independent life. And it was a failure at that. Did not have victory. But learning to live a Christ-dependent life, yielding to the Holy Spirit, reading the Word of God, allowing my mind to be transformed by the Word of God, I can have victory in Christ daily in my life. That I know not have to be look at the temporal things in my life, but I can focus on the eternal things of God. I am reminded in, the, in this specific piece of Scripture that it is God who made me alive. God made me alive in verse 2. Because before I was saved, I was dead. Spiritually dead. I was dead in my sins. Now the question I have for you is, do you need to be reminded of God's power in your life? Do you? If God can take you, who were spiritually dead, and ultimately when you place your faith in Christ, He can change your eternal destiny from a hell you deserve to a heaven you own. That power... If God can change your eternal destiny by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, what can he do in your life today? I think a lot of times we, as Christians, show up here on Sunday and we, we try to be filled by the Holy Spirit as Ephesians 4 does. 
But that little hour doesn't do quite a filling. We've got to get into our word daily. But I say, what else can he do in your life by grace alone, through faith alone? My wife and I were talking this week, and I believe your faith is your reality. If you say, ah, you know, maybe he won't, well, then maybe he then probably won't happen. I, you know, not, I, don't, I don't believe in you name it, you claim it, but I ultimately do believe if you believe it, it will happen. If your will is his will and his will is your will and it's aligning with what he has desires for you, it will happen. Do not put your faith in the circumstances, you know, your health. He didn't deliver you to, you to today. Ultimately, I oftentimes think like my back. Did he provide us this building to deliver us that ultimately I could be, you know, have to live with this? No. I believe it is a season for me to study. It's a season for me to be ultimately more dependent on him because he has bigger things planned for me and I believe for that. And you have to. And I say God is all powerful. It is him and him alone that can change a person's destiny. The power that raised up Jesus, the power that raised up Jesus is the same power that lives in us. The power of God exceeds all other powers. We know that in verse 121. So we as a body... And this is a challenge. We need to never underestimate God. And as a, God, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a body, God can take us sinners. And he can turn, and we can, he can take us and turn us into a living organism called the church. And we are a body with his power. And we can do mighty things. Mighty things. And I ask that you turn over to Philippians 1, 19, 20, page 568 there. Because... One of the examples is, I believe in the power of prayer as a body. Paul here is in jail. And salvation in verse 19 is not salvation as in saved to heaven. Because we need, after that, we do need daily salvation in our life. Daily wins. Daily triumphs. Philippians 1, 19, 20 says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Through your prayer. Through your prayer. You can't tell me there's not power in prayer. Paul's in prison. And matter of fact, in the Philippines, there, you know, he, we know he's in prison in Rome there, I believe, when he writes the, the letter of the Philippines, Philippians. But ultimately, we know that he's in the Philippians jail at one point in Acts 16, and he was beaten. But we can see there's power in prayer, that through the prayer, he's delivered, because it's in the supply of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or death. People praying helps deliver people through trials in life. Maybe you're de dealing with a physical ailment. Maybe you're going through a death. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you're having some family troubles. And maybe you're trying to do it all on your own. I would ask that you would ask someone to pray for you and that you would remember them in prayer daily. So we know salvation does not mean going to heaven. Paul's already saved. Paul needs daily deliverance from trials in life and prayer helps him with that. <laughs> if prayer helped Paul, I think it can help me and you. If there's anything that we could, should covet, I say we need to covet prayers. And I say let us pray for each other. Verse 2 and 3 of Ephesians. We read that, but Paul is reminding the Ephesians what family they were part of before trusting in Christ. We reviewed that last week. We know that before we're saved, we were children of wrath, children of disobedience. Satan is the father of that family. He's not my dad today. Verse five, 4 and 5 Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, we see there Paul explaining the love of God demonstrated towards them. Paul telling them that love is demonstrable. It's a verb. It's actionable. You can see it happening. 
So when I, I need to read the Word of God daily because I need to be reminded in the Word how much God loves me. There was a time in my life I didn't need to hear. I was, I, I was like, you know, I, I got this. But I, you know what? I need to read the Word of God daily. I need to be reminded in the Word of God how much He loved me. And if you look at verse 4 and 5 there, it says, rich in mercy. First of all, he's rich in mercy. And mercy to me is amazing. I love the songs, you know, Almost Home, I think, Mercy Me Sings. A couple great songs. There was another one that I really like. It's drawing a blank. But you know what? Mercy is not getting what I deserve. And I deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. I'm a sinner, and I deserve to go to hell and pay for all my sin for all eternity. But you know what? I was dead in sins prior to believing in Christ alone. Yes, it is by grace that I'm saved, and I get something that I don't deserve. I get something I don't deserve. Heaven. The God from eternity past did this for me. He revealed himself in the flesh for me. When I read the word of God, I'm reminded of his mercy, of his grace, and his love. And I think all of his children need to be, they need to see that. And as a child, as a fleshly child, my mom and dad, I, there was, as, a, there was, as a young boy, there was nothing more that I could want more than when my dad would say, proud of you, I love you. There's not a day I don't want to go by that my son and my daughter don't hear how much I tell them I love them, I'm proud of them. And you know what? It's important because it, I understand the children that don't get that we can see that children. I go to the jail on Monday nights and I ask the men, I asked a young guy, 19 years old, just a couple weeks ago, I go, when's the last time you were told that you loved? And he started to cry. When you have somebody says that I love you, that's powerful. And when I read the word of God, I'm reminded of his mercy, his grace, and his love. Honestly, it motivates me. It motivates me because I want to love him back. I love him because he first loved me. It motivates me to want to serve him. It motivates me to read his word and learn his will for me. That I have a love letter from home. That he has this, that he's put his mind on paper. That I can read my dad's mind on paper and understand what my dad, his will is for me. It motivates me, it motivates me to share the gospel of Christ with others so others can see and know his love. Because I, I don't care how rough and tough you are, there's not a man out there or a woman out there that doesn't need to hear how much God loves you. It motivates me to yield to the Spirit and allow Him to produce fruit in my life. And I tell you, I'm not a fruit producer and I'm not a fruit inspector. That is not what I am with John 15. I speak the fruit. I speak the truth. And it is through the Word of God. He ultimately does the saving. He does the producing of fruit. It's my job to just speak truth. And I say, what about you? When you hear that you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell and he freely gives you eternal life all by grace alone, through faith alone, does that motivate you? Does that move you? Because, you know, it's like a hot fire. You know, you, you're alive, but sometimes, you know what? That, those, that ash gets on, the, on those, on those uh, coals. And sometimes you need a little raking of those coals to get them them churning, get that fire, get that ember burning again, ultimately. And I would say, when you hear this, it should stir something within you. Knowing that you'll never go to hell, ever, and you'll forever have eternal life. Knowing nothing will change that outcome of that. Because what God promised, He will deliver. And the question is, if that doesn't motivate you, I ask you this, who else has died for you? Who else has given you eternal life? No, no one, I say. And I say, when you hear that, does that stir your emotions and feelings? It probably does. But probably what happens next is this. And your flesh nature kicks in and says, God can't use me. I'm not smart enough. I don't know the Bible. I'll make myself a fool. I would embarrass him. You might be flooded with guilt and shame. I don't know. I can speak from my history. Those are some of my thoughts. 
But I also say this, if God can use me, he can use you. Because I had those same feelings. Still probably at times in my life get those same doubts. But I say with Christ, anything is possible. And you can just take baby steps. You can grab some heaven tracks in the back and when you go to dinner, leave a heaven track. You walk through the L&M line, you leave a heaven track. Say, hey, I got something free to read. You can read it if you want. If not, okay. You can be like, hey, I'm going to church Sunday. They don't ask for money. Why don't you come on off? You know, whatever. Whatever your heart is telling you, take that step. Do it. Because with God, anything's about it. Pray about it, read about it, pray about it, read about it, pray about it, read about it, and do something. God is a well. God is a well. This summer, with all the droughts and reading the you know the Old Testament with Israel, often I've found that you know what, when there's a spiritual drought, it often aligns with a physical drought for the nation Israel. Pandemics, famines, droughts. And I believe the United States is in a spiritual drought. And we were this summer, fall, we've had physical droughts. Wells, and when I say wells, like the wells that Abraham dug, wells have dried up. We have pastors today that are wells that are dry. They don't speak life. They don't speak the water of life. But you know what God is? God is a well of an everlasting grace, everlasting mercy, and everlasting life. He's an endless source of power. He's an endless source of mercy and grace and love in my life. And he's God. He's my dad. He's a well that never runs dry. You know, and I was really thinking about that. I thought about Zechariah chapter 4. You can turn over to Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, I believe, has 14 chapters in the Old Testament. He's considered a minor prophet, but just because they're minor prophets doesn't mean they had, you know, major things to say, because they did. But Zechariah 4 gives us this picture. Two trees. And ultimately a bowl. It had lines that came from the tree, these olive trees, and these lines would go to the bowl, and ultimately from the bowl there'd be seven lines that went to seven lamps. And it ultimately gives me a picture of this. But let me read it. It says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me. And he said, As a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and has, has seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps. So you can see this bowl with pipes running down to the lamps, the source of the light. Seven pipes to seven lamps which are upon thereof, and two olive trees by it. One upon the right and the other side of the bowl, another upon the left side. So I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And I just think of this well. The source of power, the source of grace, mercy, and love in our lives is that. It's an endless source of grace for all mankind. The source of grace comes from a living God, just like those living olive trees. A continued source of olive oil for the lamp, and that is the light. And ultimately, Jesus Christ is all those things in our life. And it is God's grace that's all sufficient and is how a person is saved. And when Christ died, he died on the cross for all mankind. And let me repeat that when Christ died, he died on the cross for all mankind's sins. And if Christ can't save the best of sinners, he can't save the worst. Now, let me clarify. God does not see this person worse than others. Doesn't see, you know, Shannon, you know, better than me. God sees us all as sinners. All of us have missed the mark of perfection. All of us need his righteousness imputed to our account to get to heaven. However, but let's look at it from man's perspective. If Christ can't save the best of sinners, 
He can't save the worst. And if Christ can't save the worst, he can't save the best. He has to be able to pay for all sin, for all sinners. Either he does it all or he does none. For him to save you from your sins, he has to be able to save the best and the worst of sinners. That's grace. Because if he only saved the good sinners, that would take grace and they would turn it into a merit. That then would be a work. Because it's only the good ones. They're doing something. So for him to save the best, he's got to be able to save the worst. And man sure likes to put people into categories. Boy, he's not as bad as I am. Or he's worse than me. No. With God, there is no impartiality. And we're going to read that in Ephesians. He does not have any favorite children. He does not have any favorites. Also, if God doesn't give a person eternal life the very second they believe, it's meaningless. And what do I mean by that? What good is eternal life if I was to get it a year from now? Or five years from now? Or maybe, like some of the Lordship Salvation teaches, that you maybe get it when you die. Not really sure, no. Eternal life is given the very second person believes. And Christ alone for salvation as their only hope, as their only hope of going to heaven. They need to understand that. We as his children need to understand that the second I believe is the second I'm made alive. It's the second I become a child. It's important to understand that. We also need to understand that man cannot out sin his grace. Rich in grace. Romans 5 says, By one man, sin entered into the human race, which was Adam, and sin passed down to mankind. And then it goes on in Romans 5, it says, By one man, Jesus Christ, paid for all sin for humanity. Humanity is still limited in its human condition. So let me explain this about the power. So many people think, Oh, God won't pay for that sin, and we can label sin all we want. People like to put categories, and I'm not going to put anybody in categories. I'm not going to say this group or that group. You know what? But sure, man likes to put this group. No, he didn't pay for those sins of those people. But you need to understand that him, humanity still has limits, even in sin, because we're human. So human... Humanity is still limited in its human condition related to sin. It has limits. Even in sin, man has limited power. However, God's power is not human. He is infinite in his power and he died paying for every sin. So even though we have limited, our power is limited and we can, sin can go up this far, God's power goes beyond that. You cannot out sin grace. Not that we should try because Romans 6 says, God forbid. Like Jack said, we should not be a stumbling block. But you need to know you can't out sin grace. That's how his, we're, we're rich in his grace. As believers, we need to be reminded of this fact that he's rich in mercy, rich in grace. There's an endless source of it that comes from a living God. His love is great, and it is him that makes alive, which is all by grace. Person does not get to go to heaven by turning from sin. That's a work. If your faith is being placed and you're turning from sin, you're not going to make it. A person does not get to heaven by picking up your cross. I've talked to men, you've got to pick up your cross. If your faith is placed in you picking up your cross, you're missing it. You're not understanding it. Verse 5 says, You were dead in your sins, and it's God that made you alive. As believers, we need to never confuse salvation with service. Before a person can ever serve, they must be born again. And after you're born again, you're a child. If you want to dedicate your life after you're a child, I say yes. But you don't dedicate it before. Because you know what? When you're born, you can have two paths. Disobedient child, obedient child. Which path are you going to choose? I've been the disobedient child, and I'm not happy with that. Brought a lot, brought a harvest, harvest of heartache and shame and things like that. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, the time I have, I wanna bring honor and glory to my Father in heaven. 
And the challenge is, do you want to be a fisherman? Do you want to dedicate your life in serving the Lord for the rest of your life after you're saved? And I always say, do it. Do it. Our life is short. You can't take it with you. You can gain the whole world and you take none of it with you. But man, if you win a soul, one soul, that's a crown of rejoicing that you'll have forever in heaven. Verse 6. Paul here explains to the Ephesians that by grace, by God's power, they're already sitting in the heavenlies. And I'm like, man, that is... that. I, when I read that, I'm like an awestruck when I read verses like that. It reminds me of verse 1, 3. It says, all in 1, 3b, blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly in places in Christ. All spiritual blessings are received in Christ Jesus. There's a part of me that's already in heaven. And I say, God, writing through Paul, wanted the Ephesians to know that they're, they are positionally secure. I ask myself, if God wanted the Ephesians to know that they are positionally secure in Christ because the preposition in, if you look at in, Christ Jesus, the preposition in tells us where the action takes place. And I think God wants me to know that I am in the heavenlies. There's a piece of me that's connected to God in heaven. I'm reminded of verses like this, that when I die, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, I'm absent from the body and present with the Lord. And I can know that I will not be doing any grave sleeping in the future. I will not wander in space. I've been in the jail one time and the man says, would you pray for my friend? I said, sure. I go, what would you pray? He goes, well, he died last year and pray that, you know, his soul would, you know, he'd find his way. There is no finding your way. You'll be absent from the body, present Lord, absent from the body, and in hell. And I'm reminded of a verse like this, that I'm in Christ. I will not wander in space waiting for my spirit to be reincarnated. I will not travel through time and hopefully in time, wait, you know, I might make my way to the eye in the sky. No, I am in Christ. I'm absent from the body and present Lord. I am find confidence in the word of God. Again, I'm reminded of God's power. It's only God that can make me be part of God in heaven. Only God can make me a piece of him. That's the power of God. What about you? When you read this in context, what do you think the original author's message was for the recipients of the letter of Ephesians? Do you think the Holy Spirit wrote through Paul? Do you believe 2 Peter 1, 21? Or 2 Timothy 3, 16, that this is God's breathed word? Do you think the message the Holy Spirit had for them is relevant for us? Does God want you to know you're secure? Does he want you to know that you're positionally in Christ? Does he want you to know that? Do you know that? You are preserved in Christ when you place your faith alone in Christ alone, apart from works. Do you know that it is not you persevering in the faith that keeps you saved? Some people think that it is their faithfulness that keeps them saved. No, that's a work. You are in Christ. Do you see it? When you place your faith in Christ alone as your only hope to save you from hell to heaven, you are born again, you are raised from the dead, you are made alive in Christ. God is good. And his divine wisdom with his death payment for sin, burial, and resurrection. I love it. When we believe, we can see how we were dead in our sin, but we, when we believe, God takes his death for our debt of sin and we can be seen as Christ, seen in Christ. How we were buried with him, how we were actually died with him on the cross. We were buried with him and we resurrected with him. We live because he lives. The grandma pinched her. We as a body should see what Christ has done for us. We as the body of Christ should be motivated for others to hear what we know. Look at verse 7. This should hit home with you. Paul tells the Ephesians that one day, one day, you will understand the riches of God's grace, God's kindness demonstrated towards us through Christ. I think about that, and I wonder, how will I understand? 
and the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness. Might show. Hmm. I think about that and I wonder how will I understand that? Will I understand the, the exceeding riches of his grace one day? And I like to think, I think vividly, I think in pictures, I do think, and sometimes I have very radical, extreme ideas at times. And I often was standing there and I'm like, will I stand on the edge of the pits of hell and see what I've been saved from? That I will stand there and be like, wow, that's what I actually deserve and that's what I'm saved from? And this is what I'm saved to. Because if you turn over to Revelation chapter 20, 10 through 15, we're going to look at, there's two, there's two judgments. There is the judgment seat of Christ, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The believers, children, God's children, ones that trust in Christ alone, they will be rewarded like Moriah for their service. What they do for God. They'll also be reminded of things burnt up, but they themselves will not be burnt up. Things that they could have had. Rewards they could have had. Then there's another judgment. It's called the White Throne Judgment. And it will happen after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Revelation 20, verse 10 through 15, we have a picture there. There's two books in heaven. There's a book. And then there's also a book called the Book of Life. And let us read here, Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. There's a literal fire breathing. There's a literal hell. Where the beast and the false prophet are. Revelation 13. We, we're, we are moving towards the beast system. The 70th week of Daniel. That ultimately the seven years of tribulation. Where, where there's a one world economic, political and religious system. Germany just opened the church this year in May. They broke ground. It's called the church of one. It actually has three main world religions coming together. They're all claiming their faith, their lineage through Abraham. You have Christians that go through Abraham, through Isaac. You have Judaism that goes through Abraham. And then you have the Muslims all bringing together. We're going to see more houses like this coming together, all claiming we all serve the same God. No, we don't. That beast system that we're working here, we're going to, ultimately in the three and a half years in, you're going to see ultimately... The beast and the false prophet. Satan enters a man. Just like he did in Judas Iscariot. He will enter a man again. And that, that man, will, he will be the superman. Think about it. Look at all the marvel. All the super, all, everything's turning into superheroes. We're looking for the superman right now. The man that has all the answers. And there will be a man that will come on. He will have all the answers. Peace and safety is what he will preach. And the world will buy it. You can read it in Revelation 13 yourself. But the beast and the false prophet are shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Some people say that in total annihilation. Well, I don't, I don't see total annihilation here. Day and night forever and ever. Look at 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There will be nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, spiritually dead. Now we read this in Ephesians 1, 2, 1. We were all dead. We were all this spiritual. So these people are dead. They're, they're spiritually dead. Saw the dead, small and great. Stand before God and the books were open. You have presidents, you have kings, you have billionaires, and you have peasants. The homeless. Doesn't matter who you are in life. If you have not trusted Christ alone, you will stand before him. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Two books. You trusted in Christ alone. Your name is in the book of life. 
Now the other book, you will be judged according, and I don't understand why people can't make this connection because people are telling people, follow the law to get to heaven, do good works to get to heaven, you know, follow rituals, get sacraments, get water baptized. And look what's happened here. The dead will be judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead and were in it and death and Hades delivered and the dead were in them and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. The second death. That's spiritual death. See, you know what? I'm born twice. Just like Nicodemus, Jesus said, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You must be born again to enter in the kingdom of God. You got two births. You got to have two births because you have two births, you have one death. You got to be physically born and spiritually reborn and you will experience one death, a physical death. If you have one birth, you will have two deaths. You will have a physical death and the second death is a spiritual death and you will be judged according to your works because works never pay for sin and ultimately you'll be cast in the lake of fire forever. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast. Man. And people say, oh yeah, you might watch that. He's using scare tactics. I'm not using scare tactics. Hell is real. People go there every day and Satan is the problem. He deceives people. Verse 10. Great throne. Nowhere to hide. Verse 11. The greatest of kings, presidents. Doesn't matter who you are. You deny Christ. You're going to hell. Two books. Lamb's book of life and the books. The dead were judged out of the books according to the works. Ultimately... Believe not? Hell. Now one day, will I witness that? Two things, if I do. Will I stand on the edge of the lake of fire and see exactly what I was saved from? I'll be like, yeah, now I understand how rich his grace is and how rich his mercy was. But I also can understand that he's a holy God and a judging God. And if you reject what Jesus Christ did for you, he will honor your decision. Man, I understand God's grace and kindness, but do I really comprehend it? One day I will. How about you? Do you see the exceeding riches of his grace given to you? Do you see his kindness demonstrated towards you. God's amazing. He is. All the attributes of God are demonstrated in the gospel of Christ. You want to see love? Right there. You want to see compassion? Right there. You want to see patience? Right there. You want to see kindness? Right there. All the attributes of God. We, you study the gospels and every attribute is witnessed right there. And the attributes that we as a living body, we can see how Christ did them. We then can learn to apply them in our lives. We can look and read about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Look at the last two verses there. John 13, 15 and 1 Peter 2, 21. But 5, 16, John 13, he's the example. Now, in, in this context here, we're just coming into the upper room. John 13, I believe, is where washes the feet. Yeah. It's the last 24 hours of Christ's life. In the context here, he gives the, the upper room discourse, chapters 14, 15, and 16. 17, he goes to the garden, he prays. 18, he's betrayed. 19, he's on the cross. We can see these last hours. But as a body, it's why I picked Ephesians. Because as a body, we can learn how to walk as a believer. The body, Ephesians teaches us how to walk as a husband, teaches us how to walk as a wife, teaches us how to walk as a body of believers, to have harmony and peace and love towards each other. And John 13, 15 says this, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. 
Now, and again, this is related to foot washing. But in the context here of his last 24 hours, I also think it's related to everything that he demonstrated there. We as a body could demonstrate that to the community. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For even I hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. When he was on the cross, they mocked him. You know, actually they brought him in front of the Ananias, some of the religious leaders at the time, and a couple guys punched him in the face. And they say, why don't you prophesy, why don't you tell us who hit you? They slapped him and mocked him. Makes me kind of sad, you know, I mean, just like, why? And then he's on the cross. And they like, uh, he saved others, but he can't even save himself. But you know, he was saving us. But we can learn that. And then when we walk in this world, when people mock us, I think we want to puff up and be like, yeah, you know what, you, know, you might want to, but no. Probably need to pray for them. Because you know what, we want not one person to go to hell. We don't want to be a stumbling block to anybody. Even my worst enemy, I would not want to go to hell. And maybe me showing that person just a little kindness, maybe that will be just what that person needs to see the light of Christ. And maybe they would believe. Hell is real. The harvest is plentiful, but few laborers. And I say, let us labor together for the gospel of Christ. Let us be examples of his kindness. Let us share the riches of his grace. Now, 8 and 9, if you go back to Ephesians 2, 8 9, love, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I know the Bible does not contradict itself the Bible has given us clear passages like this, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, so then we can understand James 2, 14 through 17. Salvation is apart from yourself. Nothing I do to save me. Salvation is a gift from God. It's a gift. You freely accept it or you don't. Salvation is not a works. It's not a boasting. Is there anything I have to do if I'm in heaven because I turn from my sin? I'm not there. Do you see what God's saying here? God does not contradict himself. And I say as a body of believers, we should be motivated to share with others this awesome message. The Bible never contradicts itself. This is how we're saved. Paul's reminding the Ephesians how they're saved. And whenever people want to go to James 2 or Hebrews 6, we can always go back to say, this is God's word, doesn't contradict. If we're thinking there's a different way of salvation, we're not understanding it. God does not contradict. This is how we're saved. So it's through the clarity of the gospel that we can understand difficult scriptures. Now I want to look at verse 10. We talk about 289 a lot. But I want to talk about 10. Paul telling the people of Ephesus that God's power, that by God's power, and in the context, I love this verse. Because it is God's power that they are his workmanship. They are created in Jesus. I love this verse because I'm reminded that I'm created in Christ by Christ. We are his workmanship. I'm a child of God by his work. I did not do anything to produce or make myself created in Christ. He did that for me. It's the power of God that allowed me to be created in Him, by Him. And I ask you, do you see what God's saying to you in this verse? There are people that will use this verse and they justify lordship salvation. Saying that if a person's really saved, your life will show it. And they will quote this verse. That's not accurate. That's not what the that's not what it's saying in context. 
We are his workmanship, created in him. We, he created me. 2 Corinthians 5 says, I'm a new creation in Christ. So you have seen in scripture over and over that it's God's power that gave you life when you believed in Christ. No, this verse has nothing to do with your salvation. You doing something for your salvation it has everything for you to know that you are made alive in Christ. And there's a piece of me that's in the heavenlies, that we are his workmanship, that we're created in him. I'm already in him, know that. Now knowing all these things that God has done for you, I'm going to challenge. Are you motivated to do some good things for him? Do you do things to get saved? No. Do you do things to keep saved? No. Do you do things to show you're saved? No. We do good works because we want to please him, the one that saved us. It's God's desire that you walk in him and not in the flesh. That's why God has given us the Bible so we can know that what his will is for us, for his children. We will see what the walk is for his children. The walk. We'll see here. The walk in service of a believer, chapter 4. The walk of a believer, 417. The walk of a believer, a child, chapter 5. The walk of a married man and woman, 22. So we're going to learn how to walk. As individuals, as a child of God, we're going to learn how to walk as a body. But again, I think there's a challenge. We should be motivated to seek and save the lost. Now, if you're not, I would just have you look up here for a second. If you're online, look here. Let me show you something. This hand you're representing, you and I, and the kids can even look. So if you look up here, even the kids, look at this hand. All the kids back there in the back. If you're not in church today, you're missing it because we've got a house full of kids, which is great. So look at this. Let this hand here represent you and I. This wallet here represents our sin. God loves you, but he hates your sin. Sin is what keeps you separated from him. But you know what? This is the good news. Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ. He's God from eternity past, revealed himself in the flesh, and he shed his blood for each and every one of you. He died for your sins and he was buried, resurrected the third day. If you would believe that, if you'd believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins and was buried and resurrected for you, he gives you his righteousness to get to heaven. You'd believe that, you can know you're going to heaven. Let's all close our eyes for a second. If you're saved, I would ask that you please pray for others right now. And if you walked in here today or you're listening online and your faith was placed in, a, in another object for salvation, for going to heaven, and maybe you thought your church or your priest or your pastor or your good deeds, your communion was saving you, I challenge you to change the object of your faith right now. Because you can know you're going to heaven when you die. Think about it. Everybody has their faith in something. And if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you say, because it's a one-time deal. What's stopping you right now from accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior? What do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose. Everything to gain. If you're sitting here today listening online, you know you're a sinner. You know you're not perfect. If you're five years old, six years old, it doesn't matter. If you're sitting here today and listening on, you heard how much God loves you. You heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, for all your sins, and he resurrect and he freely wants to give you eternal life right now you can trust in christ as your only hope to save you from a hell you deserve to have you know and in your mind you can say something like this it's not the prayer that saves you it's what you believe say father you know what i don't know i don't know the bible i don't know a lot but i know this i know i don't want to go to hell when i die i believe that jesus christ died on the cross for my sins and resurrected for me you can say, thank you, Father, because that's who he became. You were born again right then and there by believing that. Saying the prayer doesn't save you. It's what you trust. Are you trusting in Christ alone? I hope so. Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. Thank you for 
the building that you've provided here, but more importantly, we thank you for the body of believers that you brought together, a family that we're working together to further into the gospel of Christ, that we can come here and hear your words. And Father, we can be motivated. We can see your will. In John 14, 31 there, ultimately we know that Christ loved you, and it says why he loved you. He did the will of the Father. And we know your children here love you. That we'd be motivated to share the gospel with others. And maybe there's somebody here today, a child of God, that says, you know what? I want to be a fisher of men. I say, yes, do it. Let's, we, let us all become soul winners. Let us all, as children of God, let us grow up in Christ. Let us all dedicate our lives and ultimately wanting to serve him and win souls. Because you know what? God took 12 fishermen and he changed the world. He can take 12 families in northern Minnesota and we can work together and be mighty warriors for God. We can change the world. We can change our community just by having the attributes of God, kindness, love, grace, mercy. Bringing people out letting people know there's a heaven and hell. And Father, we just pray that you be with the people, your children, that they get in the word, read the word, grow up in grace. And Father, we just pray that you continue to bring people out. And Father, we just pray that you be with everybody today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing our last song.